Uh, my pleasure to welcome the President Pro Tempore of the California Senate, the Honorable Don Parada. Thank you, sir. That's the, uh, that's the governor. That's the governor, yeah. Yeah, the governor can't stand to be upstage. He's having a press conference at 2.30 to talk about something, so I should be finished by then. Uh, actually, I'm sorry I was a little late today. I had to, uh, I didn't have to, but I volunteered to go by Zelda's to pick up the pizzas for the Republican caucus today at noon, and unfortunately they invoked the rule of eight. Ackerman had six votes for pepperoni. Yeah. George Runner, who uh, uh, has a vegetarian insurgency going, you know, you know George. Uh, Denham couldn't recall what he ordered. And, yeah, it's, you're chewing too loudly. And uh, McClintock, well, Tom doesn't recognize pizza because it wasn't invented in the 18th century. As the... Uh, Regular session was winding down. I kept complaining to my staff that I was getting tired, I can imagine you were too, of having press conference after press conference where I just said the obvious. So they accepted this speech here today so I could give a speech uh, to say the obvious. Uh, if you're expecting anything newsworthy to happen in the next 20 minutes or so, I would just rest and continue eating. You might even want to drink some wine. I think they were getting even with me because I made them work on a holiday People wanted to know why an Italian would blow off uh, Columbus Day. And I pointed out that I represent Berkeley now, and that's Indigenous Peoples Day in Berkeley. So uh, it didn't matter much. It's been a real challenging year so far. And unlike a lot of us, uh, was hoped it's not over. Governor decided he likes postpartisanship so much that uh, he wanted to continue. So he called not one but two special sessions. Then, of course, he left the country. Uh, I certainly understand that impulse. Today we're having a floor session at 2 o'clock between this and the governor's press conference. We're going to squeeze in a little public business. And I'd like to tell you uh, I knew it was going to go on, but I don't. Uh, I will bring up my water bond candidly if the vote were being held in this room right now. I don't think it will pass. Uh, it's, a, it's a shame uh, in many ways because this has been seven months of hard work and it's been really seven months of work that not only involved uh, bipartisanship, Republicans and Democrats alike, particularly in the Senate, working together, trying to fashion uh, a proposal that everyone could support. Uh, we've fallen short and it's really only about one thing, uh, it's about dams. If you look at the Cogdill uh, Schwarzenegger proposal, I, excuse me, the Schwarzenegger Cogdill, don't you, may, I corrected that, Schwarzenegger Cogdill. Governor's still got 650 bills to sign. Uh, if you look at his bill side by side with mine, there's a lot of commonalities there. Uh, we are centering uh, on the Delta. Part of the reason is because we've known for some time that it's collapsing, but more importantly, the judge's decision made it so. But it really comes down to dams, and the governor's proposal spends, his is $9.4 billion, uh, over half of which is dedicated to dams. Now, whether or not you include the names of the dams is really irrelevant. The real question is, why are we doing dams? It's not a question for me, should we or should we not? Uh, I have, you know, no particular ax to grind, uh, whatever the appropriate uh, metaphor would be, uh, with building dams. However, if you have so much money to spend, you normally spend according to your priorities. And the priorities, I think, fall out pretty clearly. You have to fix the center or the heartbeat or the pump or whatever you choose to call it of the California water system, which is the delta. And then you should look to what the voters are going to ask you when you put a bond on the ballot. What's in it for me? It's a very legitimate question. It is their money. And most voters are more concerned about their pocketbook than they are about high-minded public policies. They don't have a great respect for people who are talking about their interests. They want to know about their own self-interest. And they look to us to represent that self-interest, kind of an old-fashioned idea. So what we have proposed, basically, 
is cheaper, faster, twice the amount of water, and requires private interest to pay rather than having subsidies paid by taxpayers. Now, that's a case that I could make clearly to the voters of this state. Arnold Schwarzenegger could make this clear to the voters of the state. You can't make that same argument about dams. It is just simply this. If people are being told that they can, uh, when their tap water, when they turn on the tap, water is going to be there, their water bills are not going to rise, they can understand that. And you can say you're recycling so that, in, you know, we, California is a desert state, but it's been no more pronounced than if you go to Riverside County, you go to Palm Springs, look at the golf courses down there that are lush green. They're all being fertilized by our water. So if you tell somebody, we're going to recycle the water that goes in, in, uh, and keeps those golf courses green, people understand that. If you say in Northern California, in a place called Glen County, there will be a dam, hard sell. This is a large state. So when you give anything in front of the voters, what you tell them is what's in it for them, what is the benefit? It's that simple. Now, there are some people that say it's not perfect. Well, I'm going to be dead before there's anything perfect. And if I live a long life, it's not going to get perfect. So I've heard, you know, let's wait for some more studies. How many studies are there that have to be conducted and put somewhere in the bureaucracy before we realize that action is what's required now? We learned a lot last year, the last couple of years, with our infrastructure bonds. We found out that if you make a credible case to people, they'll vote for them. Very few people thought we could ever pass a $5 billion water bond or levy bond last year. But the nexus between what was going on in the Gulf and what was, could go on in California was very clear in the minds of voters. So they overwhelmingly supported it. Not people who were living in the floodplains of Natomas, but people who were living in Riverside, in Coachella. I mean, people got it. They understood that. They also understood that if you're going to build highways and roads, they have to have some correlation to the approximate need. We gave that to them. They voted for it. They voted for $3 billion in housing so that we could try to get people to recycle property into productive use rather than despoiling the orchards and the ranches and open space. They got that. We went four for four. And we did it not because we're brilliant. We did it because, one, we were able to create the priorities that people understood were important. And secondly, because Democrats and Republicans work together. Now, I still hold out possibilities that that could happen today. Not a lot, but some. But what gives me the hope for it is that we've spent seven months working on this, so we're not you know, rushing to judgment here. And much more importantly, you have never seen as broad an array of public support and special interest support than behind this bond. And it's not because it's my bond. It's because everybody who is supporting this realizes it's the best available option. So we've got the Metropolitan Water District, one of the largest, if not the largest in the country, supporting it, along with the NRDC and the Friends of the River, they have never before been together in the same place at the same time supporting the same thing. We have many environmental groups. We have lots of water districts. We have the chambers of cities like Los Angeles who are a little nervous about not supporting the governor's thing, but when it came down to it, they felt that more interest were being served by looking at this bond with its emphasis on a variety of things. If, this, if you read this bond carefully, you could build dams if that's what you choose to do. But I ask the question, and I think you ought to be asking the question, if you build sites, if you build temperance flats, after you run to the map and find out where the hell they are, 
then ask the question, well, who's going to benefit by that? Who is going to benefit by that water? And if there is a benefit there, a beneficial use fee ought to be affixed to it. I don't care if agribusiness, and by the way, the farmers, you know, are not always the little guys with the hats on. If big agribusiness is going to benefit, I don't mind that. That's what the state does. It grows things. But they should pay for their own water. We should only pay for the public portion of the benefit. Now, if Big Ag wants to pony on up and sign a contract and say, I'll give you two bucks an acre foot for this water, we got a deal. Let's do that. But I don't see that happening. I don't see it happening. The Silicon Valley interests, the manufacturing base of the Silicon Valley, such as it is, is saying that we need dams. Well, I know one thing. They can't get their water from India or Southeast Asia. They got to get that water here. So why not make a business decision to get water as cheaply as you can? And that would be to have the taxpayers subsidize it. It's not a foreign concept. We subsidize lots of things. Tax breaks, tax cuts are subsidies. I pay my taxes. They don't. I mean, it's clear, easy. So if we're going to do these things, why don't we have in hand contracts that say, this is what we're going to do, and this is why, and this is who's going to pay for it. Tom Torlakson today in committee said, Tom served on the Board of Supervisors in Contra Costa County for 16 years. He was largely responsible for putting Los Volqueros on the ballot, getting public approval for it. It's a dam in Contra Costa County. What Tom said was the dam that they intended to build was three times the size of the one built. You know why? Because they couldn't find anybody that wanted to buy the water. So they built that dam with the idea that in the future they could raise it according to the need. Now, Los Volqueros is on the governor's list. I'm assuming there are people out there that will want to buy that water. So to me, this is not all that complicated. The water politics are deadly. But part of it is, it's like, you know, people think that if you speak Latin, you really have something going. It's only the really smart people do. I didn't know any better. I grew up taking Latin. Everybody was going to be a priest in those days. <laughs> if once you understand a little bit of the elements and you have good people to work on this, we've got hydrologists, engineers, we've got the best in this state. We got highly paid interests that are coming up and lobbying. So all I have to do is master what the relationship is between what we need to put on the ballot and what the voters would accept. Now what happens if that doesn't happen? Well, the reason that it won't happen, of course, and we saw this sort of being played out this summer, is the two-thirds vote requirement. You have to have compromise in order to achieve two-thirds. Well, Republicans now have realized this summer that they could hold out for seven weeks, virtually get everything they wanted and more, they got the pony in the room, and they didn't get hurt by it politically. No Republican, and it's, you know, we could talk about redistricting, I'm sure, no Republican's going to lose their seat over this. Most people just weren't paying any attention. So as a consequence, they were able to serve their masters their philosophy, their ideology, and at no cost. That same attitude is being replayed now. And I don't really blame them. You know, if you can hold your breath or put a gun to your head and say, don't move, I'll shoot, and, and people say, oh, don't do that, why not do it? And that's exactly the position they're in. They've said so. It's our turn. We want dams. And it's like dodgeball in the, in the street. I mean, our turn. But that's what they say. They got the same damn vote I have. So you got to respect and understand their point of view. However, there is an overriding issue here. If they are going to use the rule of eight, which they used very successfully this summer, very successfully today, ordering lunch, if they do that, we have no alternative than to take the body of work that's been done, go and gather the signatures in the places in this state that are supportive of this, which I believe are all over, and put it on the ballot ourselves. 
The difference from pay to play, which is an initiative where I get everybody in the room, you decide what's important to you, I tell you for $400,000 you'll be able to put this on the ballot and you pay it and then it goes on the ballot and then we say democracy works. Pay to play has done a lot in this state. The difference now is this was a body of work that has been brought through the legislative process, thousands of hours of negotiations. Everybody with an interest was represented consistently. The only people that weren't engaged were those that didn't want to be. So if you take this and put it on the ballot, you have already vetted it in a way that a pay-to-play initiative never could. I was told today that there will be dueling initiatives. I'll take that challenge. I'll put this particular piece of work on the ballot with one that offers to build, use half the money to spend on cement bunkers benefiting God knows who. I'll take that bet any day of the week. We will have that public debate and we'll win. It's a stupid way to have to use our time. It's a dumb way to use our resources. And it's crazy to have people squaring off on something that we should be agreed upon. And that is how California waters itself. But I am prepared if this thing does not happen today to immediately go for title and summary tomorrow the Attorney General's office and ask the interests who have worked so hard for so long on this particular proposal to join with us and continue the effort to take it to the ballot, make the case to the public. It seems to me that if we don't do our job thoroughly or completely, we have to complete it in some other manner. That is the one chosen. We didn't have that opportunity with the budget. We do have this opportunity now with this. And I will tell you that I think we have figured out through our last bonds, and you remember, lots of us worked really hard on those bonds, but the person who's given the credit for it appropriately is the governor of the state of California. So our governor will have to make a decision, campaign for both, campaign for one, what is he going to do? But we will be able to campaign for these and be successful. So that's what my forecast for the afternoon is. I'll be sorry if we can't get it done. I told the governor earlier, you know, we always seem to run out of time, we run out of road. But we are out of time. The Secretary of State said, Monday next week, you give me whatever you got or it's not going to get on the ballot for February. And why February? Because there is an urgency here that will be punctuated by that election. If there's something on the ballot, if people in Southern California are beginning to see their water rationing imposed and their bills going up, which is what their providers are suggesting will happen, then we want to be on the ballot. We'll be it to any politician in Sacramento having to run around the state and explain why we didn't do anything. Not a good position to be in. So with that, I'm going to uh, say to you, uh, I, probably a lot of you never heard of The Who, but they had a successful uh, hit called We Won't Be Fooled Again. And uh, having been through this once this summer, I will not be fooled again. Uh, if it's going to be, we'll always have to negotiate still one more thing and then we'll be finished. Today, we're finished. We'll take the next step. We'll move on. Thank you very much. And uh, I stop talking now. You can start.